Hi there, I'm Greg Wyckoff from the Center for Academic Achievement. Uh, I work as a chemistry and biology tutor. Today I want to talk about um, one of the more basic concepts in chemistry, something I actually get a lot of people asking about, uh, the mole. Um, what the mole is, is basically just an obscenely large number of molecules. And the reason we use it is because it's really hard to measure molecules one at a time. So instead we use the mole uh, as an easier way of, of taking measurements in the laboratory. And it's, the thing about chemistry is it builds on itself and kind of goes up from the basics. And if you let basics like this slip out from under you the whole rest of the semester, and, and chemistry too, are going to be really hard for you. So today we're just going to kind of take a more in-depth look at, at one of the simpler concepts in chemistry, but something that's easy to forget about and something that's pretty important. All right, so like I said before, um, the reason we use the mole is because it's really difficult to measure molecules on, on a one-by-one one basis. It's, like I said, difficult and expensive. So instead, we use a number called um, Avogadro's number, which is the value of a mole. Uh, when you ask most students in chemistry one and two what the mole is, they say Avogadro's number, but they don't really have a concept of what that means. They don't put the units behind it. So Avogadro's number, for our purposes, is equal to 6 point zero two two times ten to the twenty third power um, and again the units on that are going to be molecules when you're working with just elements by themselves it can be atoms but for more complex molecules stuff like h2o and glucose we're going to talk about here in a minute um, it's going to be molecules uh, so again we use this because Doing atom by atom is very difficult. Instead, we, uh, we use Avogadro's number is the value of one mole. Something else to notice about this um, is that because it's molecules, one molecule of a more complex compound can be broken into multiple molecules, or by extension, multiple moles of a more simple compound or element. So let's take, for example, a good biological example, something you see a lot, glucose which has the formula C6, H12, O6. So in this, we have, let's say we have one mole of glucose. Inherent in one mole of glucose, um, looking at these subscripts, there are six moles of carbon atom and six moles of oxygen atoms. That's sort of a more complicated example than I want to talk about today. Instead, um, I'm going to do a couple equations using something that everybody should be familiar with, water, which has the formula H2O. I'm going to have to excuse my handwriting. It's not the greatest in the world, but it, it should be legible. Um, what this tells us, looking at this, again, is that there are two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen. Uh, there's no subscript, so we assume it's a one in one molecule of water. Again, because the mole is a measure of a number of molecules, we can extrapolate that and say that in one mole of water, there are two moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen. Now that we have kind of an understanding of what the mole is um, and where it comes from, Let's talk about the generic mole formula as it's going to apply to equations that you're actually going to do in your chemistry class. And it's going to be written like this. Um, our formula is number of moles, typically uh, denotated MOL, is equal to our mass in grams divided by molar mass. Um, if you don't know what molar mass is, that's OK. We'll talk about it in just a second. Um, Actually, to hell with that. We'll talk about it right now. What molar mass is, and you'll see this written a couple different ways. You might see AW for atomic weight. You might see AM for atomic mass. I like molar mass because it makes it real clear that you're talking about the mole and the mass of one mole. If we look at our periodic table for an element, say carbon, it's going to look something like this. That's a little small for you. We have our C here in the middle. We have six on the top. That's the atomic number of carbon. And down on the bottom, we have the atomic mass. Again, I like to say molar mass. It's a little bit um, different than 12, but 12 is sort of our estimation to make calculations a bit easier. We'll definitely be using it today. Um, if you're wondering where the Avogadro's number comes from, 
Avogadro's number is the number of molecules in 12 grams of carbon. I don't know how they measured that. It was probably really hard, so we're not going to get into that right now. But you can see, if I say, if we have 12 grams of carbon, and the molar mass of carbon is 12 grams per mole, that leaves us with canceling out units. 12 over 12 is equal to 1 mole of carbon. Something that's also pretty relevant that you're going to want to be doing uh, quite a bit is going to be manipulating that mole formula to solve for various unknowns. For example, let's look at that mole formula again. Moles are equal to mass over molar mass. Grams is the SI unit for mass. That's why I'm going to write that as G. If, for example, we are looking at an unknown compound of unknown molar mass, but we're given grams and we're given moles, we want to isolate molar mass by itself. And we can do that using simple algebra. Let's multiply both sides by molar mass. And what we can do then is cancel out. We have one on the bottom of the fraction and one on the top. And what that's going to look like is this, m, m times mole is equal to grams. That actually is going to be the formula if we needed to solve for grams by itself. Again, when you do this, you want to try and isolate the unknown on its own side of the equation. But again, uh, like I said, we'll do molar mass first. So now we want to get molar mass by itself. We'll divide both sides by moles. We can cancel them out of the left side of our equation. We have it on the top and the bottom of a fraction. Recall from Algebra 1 and 2 in high school. And what we're left with, molar mass is equal to grams divided by moles. So again, that's one of the derivations of the mole formula that's going to be really important to you, and you're going to be using that a whole lot. Here in just a second, I'll write down all three of them so you can kind of tell them apart from one another and uh, really start getting those into your head. Um, Again, chemistry builds on itself. If you let the basics like this come out from under you, the advanced calculations you're going to do are going to be really hard. Now let's manipulate that same formula to solve for grams. Let's say we know the number of moles we have of a substance based on uh, maybe a chemical formula, and we know the molecular mass of that compound, but we don't know how many grams we have. Well, using the same formula, we can solve for that too. So again. Moles is equal to grams divided by molar mass. Let's isolate grams. All we have to do, it's going to be a little easier than our last one. We have just one step. We're going to multiply both sides by molar mass because we want to get that out of the denominator and over here to the left side of our equation. And we'll cancel them out on the right side because we're dividing and multiplying by the same value. And what we're left with, I'll rewrite this so grams is on the left side. We have grams is equal to molar mass times number of moles. And again, that's one of the formulas you do definitely want to commit to memory. You'll be seeing it a lot, and it is well worth your time. So I'll go ahead and write down those other two mole formulas. You can uh, see them all together, dare to compare. Moles is equal to grams over mm. And our last one for molar mass is equal to grams divided by moles. So those are the three basic formulas regarding the mole that you're going to be seeing a lot of and you're going to be using them a lot. Whether you want to or not, you will memorize these. So go ahead and get that out of the way now, and it will really benefit you in the long term in chemistry. Now let's apply this to an example, something you might actually have to solve for in chemistry class or on a chemistry exam or if you're just doing some work in the lab. I'd like to talk about limiting reagent, which in a chemical equation is the reagent that you're going to run out of first. Let's take a look at our water example again. Uh, a basic formula for how that's going to be is going to look like this. We have 2H2 plus O2 goes to 2H2O. What that means is that two molecules of hydrogen gas plus one molecule of oxygen gas goes to two molecules of water. 
The reason we write these as H2 and O2 instead of um, just H and O as they appear on the periodic table is because in nature these are going to form dimers. They're going to combine with each other um, and they're going to look like this. So this is composed again of two hydrogen atoms. This is composed of two hydrogen atoms and this is composed of two oxygen atoms. Let's analyze this and figure out what it tells us regarding the mole. Well, we know that two molecules of hydrogen combine with one molecule of oxygen. So we can extrapolate that and we can say that two moles of hydrogen gas combine with one mole of oxygen gas. And those are going to form two moles of water. All right, now again, I would like to use this and apply it to uh, limiting reagents so you understand a little bit about molar ratios, because again, that's something that you're going to be seeing a lot of. Our limiting reagent or limiting reactant, you'll sometimes hear it written, um, is the reactant which is going to run out first. So let's say we run out of oxygen. When this is gone, this reaction can no longer occur. So that means the reaction is going to stop. So the limiting reagent also is responsible for stopping reaction. For example, let's say we have 5 moles of O2 and we have 8 moles of H2. Now you might be saying, oh, well, obviously we have less moles of oxygen, so that's going to run out first. But what you need to keep in mind is that these are combining at a 2 to 1 molar ratio. So in order for them to run out at the same time, we need twice as many hydrogen as we have oxygen. We can do a little simple algebra to figure out which one of these reagents is going to run out first. We have 8 moles of hydrogen and we have 5 moles of oxygen. However, we need to keep in mind that these should be combining at a 2 to 1 molar ratio. So we need to figure out if this is greater than or less than that ratio. The ratio, again, 2 moles of H2 over 1 mole of O2. I shouldn't have written this equal sign here because what we're trying to figure out is if this is greater than or less than. So 8 over 5 is going to be less than 2 over 1, less than. So in this case, we have less hydrogen than we have of oxygen. So in this case, H2 is going to be our limiting reagent. Let's analyze another one of those. I'll go ahead and give you the tip off. In this case, oxygen is going to be our limiting reagent. So let's say we have 5 moles of O2 combining with 12 moles of H2. We can write this out in much the same way we did the last one. We'll say we have 12 moles of H2 divided by 5 moles of O2. And again, we want to figure out if that's greater than or less than our molar ratio, which is 2 moles of H2 divided by 1 mole of O2. Looking at that, we can go ahead and tell that um, the left side is going to be greater. Therefore, we have a greater number of our numerator, H2, than we have of our denominator, O2. And because we have H2 in excess, we can say that we know that O2 is our limiting reagent. And that's our answer. We can also have a case where neither one is the limiting reagent. In fact, they're going to run out at the same time. Um, you're probably kind of getting the hang of this by now, so I'm not going to do all the calculations. But an example of that, saying with 5 moles of O2, and we had 10 moles of H2. 
that's going to give us uh, 10 over 5 is equal to 2 over 1. So they're equal, which means our reactants are in equal numbers for this equation. And neither one is going to limit the reaction. They're going to run out at the same time, or at virtually the same time. All right, so that's the majority of what I wanted to get through today. Um, let's just talk about, before I go, a couple more advanced applications of the mole. Because, like I said, you're going to see this thing everywhere, and it's going to keep coming up. One example is molarity. Commonly written just as big M. Molarity is a measure of concentration. It's concentration of terms of moles you have per unit volume. And our SI unit for volume is the liter. Again, you can probably notice some similarities to our mole formula, our three variable uh, formula that we had from the beginning. And you know that we can manipulate this to solve for moles. And we can also manipulate it to solve for liters. Another more advanced example is percent composition. We might be given a compound and have to figure out its formula based on various mole ratios. And of course, there are going to be a lot of other advanced examples. And you're going to figure those out as you make your way through chemistry 1 and 2, through organic, through biochemistry. Really, for any upper level chemistry classes you take from here on out, the mole is an essential concept to understand. And it's going to keep coming up. Again, chemistry builds on itself. So if you ever feel like you're losing uh, track of where you are and the stuff you're doing, try and break it down. Get back to the basics. Um, you know, make things simpler for yourself. I hope this is helpful to you guys. Um, if there's anything else I can do, like I said, come into the CFAA. We do tutoring there, uh, absolutely free of charge for any ETSU students. I know chemistry is intimidating to a lot of people, but uh, you know, just keep your wits about you. Make things simple for yourself, and, and never let your basics get away from you. Thanks a lot, guys.